Good evening. We'll call the meeting to order at 7 o'clock. And so let me run quickly over the uh, board norms, which are to maintain our focus, communicate respectfully, be present, keep the board productive and effective, and respect the agenda. Do we have any changes to the agenda? Ow. Yes, sir. Can't oh, hear can't hear it? Can't hear me. Uh, no, you need the, um... I will project. Sorry, Charlie. Thank you. Um, any changes to the agenda? All right. Seeing none, Trevor, you also have to project. Yeah, I can be All right. That. <laughs> All right. So this Friday we will be having a pep rally, and that is in support for Dingus for Dylan, which is happening this weekend, which is an amazing event that I'd love everybody to be at if you can possibly be there. Um, we have prom coming up, our Union Senior Prom, which is going to be May 20th in the Union Hall in Newfane. And then our theater program is putting on hats off on June 4th. We have a show at 2 o'clock and at 7 o'clock. And then our sports are doing pretty well. All the sports teams are doing pretty great this season. Our Ultimate Disc team actually just came from a game where we won against Mill River. Our track team is doing amazing. We have a meeting coming up tomorrow and the next day. Um, our baseball and softball teams I've heard are doing really well. They've been winning all the games. I don't know a ton about baseball and softball, but that's about it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, correspondence. Do we have any uh, correspondence we wanted to go over? Can I ask a question, sir? Of course. What happened with the town hall discussions you were having about um, some of the challenges in the bathrooms and whatnot? You could, Jack. <laughs> what happened to the, uh, the town hall discussions you were having with the student body about some of the challenges in the school? Are those continuing? At this point right now, the student council is now running the town halls, and I believe we will be having another town hall about it. But since the class that was running the town halls has ended, it's been really challenging to get all the logistics together. But I do believe there will be another town hall before the end of the year to go back over those problems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else for Trevor? Correspondence. <laughs> Bill, Bill's up here somewhere. All right, seeing, <laughs> seeing nothing on that. We're actually, um, in moving into new business, we're going to skip over, they might have just come over. Or do we have everybody that we need? Alexa, not to put you on the spot, but do we have everybody that we need for the presentation? We do? Yes, yes we do. Okay, all right, well, just in the nick of time. Do you need some time to set up? So while I just want to say while they're setting up and getting ready, um, we did not put this in here, but I would like to put a comment period in after uh, specifically their presentation, so folks can comment afterwards. You know, depending on how many you want to comment, you can limit it to a minute per comment. This is working, it sounds weird. I'm Jessana Casano. This is Lenore Widow. This is Spencer Fawson. This is Miles Ties. And this is Antero Brennacord. And today we're talking about the Rebel rebranding and focusing on does our logo and brand violate our newly adopted mascot policy. So within this presentation, we will be going over that topic. Our main thing that we are focusing on is we believe students should feel safe and welcome in our school and our logo should assist with that. So that was our main 
focus as we reviewed this. The responsible policy says, assist the school board ensuring the prohibition of school branding that directly or indirectly references or stereotypes the likeness, features, symbols, traditions, or other characteristics that are specific to either A, the creed, race, color, national origin, sexual orientation, or gender identity of any person or group of persons, or B, any person, group of persons, or organization associated with the repression of others. The part, of, the part of the policy we'd like to highlight is the newly adopted policy states that our mascot cannot have references or stereotype characteristics, whether directly or indirectly, of a person, group, or organization that is associated with the repression of others. The NAACP's letter to the Agency of Education. We agree that words have power. In the NAACP letter to the AOE, they stated the following, regarding Leland and Gray Union Middle and High School, this brings us to the rebels from Leland and Gray. Again, the term alone denotes imagery of what the native people are often referred to and, and an image of Confederate soldier rebelling against the North's perspective to do away with enslaved people. If we are to condemn stereotypes and biases, we must eliminate this way of thinking of America's past. Black Lives Matter, we can no longer hold on to these horrific beliefs. In response to the NAACP letter, rebel does not only refer to Confederate views or values. Our goal is to explain why our rebel is not associated with Confederacy. This presentation will share the origin story of the Leon and Gray rebel. Rebel is defined as a person who rises in opposition or armed resistance against an established government or ruler, the Oxford Dictionary. Notice the broad definition of rebel showing it can take on multiple different meanings. Bar uh, the Leon de Grey Rebel. Barbara, Barbara Guerrero, former school librarian, gathered L uh, Leon de Grey research. She found that Harry Robinson, class of 1959, suggested the name Rebels during a student council meeting. This happened after there was a realization that they had no name for the teams at Leon de Grey Seminary. The student body eventually voted on, on it a little bit after. According to Ms. Pelsu, a woman interviewed by Ms. Guerrero, recalls thinking it was an interesting suggestion coming from Robinson because he, has, uh, he was not a rebellious person. When Ms. Guerrero met with Robinson, he confirmed that he came up with the name Rebels. He just said it came out of his head. Now, one question that we have for you guys is, does anyone know Harry Robinson? Now, how many of you are related to Harry Robinson? I'm part of this. Focusing back on the slide, though, in other words, the students wanted a mascot and liked how Rebel sounded. There was no link to anything at this point. the inspiration of the image. If you were to look at the LGS Messenger yearbooks, you would see that before the adoption of the, re of the name Rebels, the uniforms were plain, sometimes even embroidered with incorrect spelling of the school name. The first mention of the team's name was in the 1960 Messenger. It reads, the softball team was undefeated during the season, finished by winning the Molly Stark League Championship and earned another bright, shiny trophy for the case in the seminary corridor. For the first time, the girls adopted a uniform which consists of white sweatshirts with the new LGS Rebel emblem, blue jeans, white sneakers, and caps. A team photo on page 53 of the messenger shows an emblem on their shirts. It would appear to be a kneeling soldier with a rifle, perhaps the first use of an image to represent the Rebels. Larry, Larry Gould was on the messenger staff. Mr. Gould also confirmed that the team's name Rebel was chosen by the student body in the 1958 to 1959 school year and was not associated with any symbolism. In 1961, messenger cover shows another depiction of a kneeling revolutionary soldier. When Gould asked if he thought the revolutionary soldier Rebel mascot may have evolved from team shirts and their yearbook cover, Mr. Gould agreed that it was very likely. Changes to the rebel image over time. 
Margaret Stearns, also known as Missy, taught art at Leland and Gray Seminary. Missy is the artist who created the sign shown. Missy wrote at length about the name rebels, including the inspiration for the two figures on the sign. Some of what she wrote. From my perspective, it seems that Rebels, if not officially, has emerged naturally as Lillian and Gray's mascot. The name Rebels is related to the historic participation by many of Townsend's early settlers in the American Revolutionary War and the subsequent participation of some of the same individuals along with their descendants in the establishment of this group. Another one about the changes to the rebel image. I believe the silkscreen image on the cover of the 1961 yearbook was used for more than a decade as a school logo. Must have been produced by students under Arlo Monroe's former uh, headmaster at Tutelage. I like the fact that this first rebel is not in military uniform. Anyone of probably 100 years, real individuals, inhabitants of the West River Valley, I don't know, serving and training with local militia and town military companies could have modeled for this logo. Our current logo. Margaret Steam said in Guerrero's letter, the flamboyant soldier uniformed male figure came along before the sign. It was sparked by a painting I had seen at the Shelbourne Museum. Ethan Allen demanding the surrender of Fort Ticonderoga in the name of great, the great Jehovah. Such a painting accurately emphasizes spirit through the details be but fabrications of the artist's imagination. According to Margaret Stearns, the art teacher at the LMG Seminary, is a logo and emoticon representative of humanity transforming itself, humanity engaged in social slash, slash cultural evaluation levels. What about the woman figure? Mrs. Guerrero research provided interesting connections to Vermont history as well. The image for Leland and Gray rebels evolved over time. The school sign was a gift to Leland and Gray by graduating class of 1985. The male figure already in use was repeated. The woman likewise is a symbolic figure. The conceptual image of a woman serving up cannonballs was taken from a historic painting. In conclusion, it would seem the name rebels was coined with no image in mind. The image of the revolutionary soldier and then the soldier and woman evolved shortly after the name was decided upon. Colonial rebel defining characteristics. The tri-cornered hat, the Green Mountain Boys led by Ethan Allen, the Revolutionary War, and um, they fought against British imperialism and oppression. oppression. Civil War rebel defining characteristics. Rebel was what the people in the South were referred to. They said it with pride, while the North viewed them as bad people. The rebels were the people who were in favor of slavery. The Confederate flag that the South came up with, it was to represent all they were fighting for. They carried it around a lot while at war with the North, against the strong, strong central government in favor of state rights to enslave people at the state level as opposed to a federal ban on enslavement legislation usually wore around bucket-looking hats in their soldier uniform, had decently long cotton-made coats for the uniform as well. Uh, warning, this next slide could be offensive. Feel free to look away. So um, we have a, a depiction of different mascots. We have the R Rebel, the Revolutionary, and the Confederate one. So first difference is, is the hat. We have um, a tri-cornered hat, while they have like kind of like a flatter hat. Um, the bell on the Confederate side has the um, Confederate States um, buck belt buckle, and the jackets are extremely different. So you can tell the difference, like it's pretty obvious. Um, so we're now going back to the policy that we have now adopted. And I feel like we read this earlier, so it doesn't really need to be read right now. But we did find that we do not represent the Confederate values, we represent the colonial values, and that was our main focus here. We were asked to review if we were Confederate or colonial, and we found that we were colonial. 
Um, the question to consider now is what about the colonial oppression against the native inhabitants? Because we then thought about that after finding that we were not related to Confederacy. So how are we associated with that and how would that be any different? Things for our school board to consider. After sharing the presentation with the collaborative in April, we were given the following ideas to consider. Think about harm reduction, keeping in mind that we want the least harm done possible. We don't want anything harmful associated with our school. We are not the same community that we once were. A lot has changed between 1959 and 2023. We should reflect on that change. Going back to the big idea, students need to feel safe in school. So the essential question left to consider as a school and as a community, what can we do as a school to ensure that this happens through our logo and imagery? And that's where I think we would leave it up to the board. change. It's your generation, your time. 
but I would hope as a long as you keep the rebels going. Can I add on to that with saying that it should maybe be brought to the student body? In the presentation, it said that the student body was when we voted on this originally, and they were who brought the idea forward, they were who voted on the idea of the rebels. So I think, I mean, of course, the school board has a huge impact, but we should ask the students, and that's who wants. That's who adopted originally, if you get some say. Good enough. Right, so I just want to clarify a couple things. I'm not, I certainly want to say thank you to the kids that did this, and under Keegan's leadership in the eighth grade class, it was a fantastic job. They, they've worked really hard. This is draft number, I don't know, but they've, they've worked really hard. So I want to make sure that we get give credit for them. Uh, <laughs> how many? Five. Five. So they've been, they've been working on this since like, February? I want to say it was right after you guys went to January. It's right after you guys adopted the policy. So they've been working on this for quite a while, every Friday. Um, the policy that you guys adopted was the one that was the, uh, the state model policy from the BSBA, and it's the required policy, as you know. Um, the policy, as they, as they pointed out, um, the, the board uh, has the responsibility to ensure that um, that the mascots and the branding are not offensive, obviously, in the way that they've described it, um, and, and also um, are not associated with any group or group of people associated with the repression of others. And I think that's what the kids did an excellent job of, debunking the origins that the NAACP laid out in their initial letter. Um, I, I will say one thing, the NAACP didn't come, I don't think because they were afraid to, Dan, although maybe, maybe if they'd met you, maybe they would be, I'm not sure, but, uh, <laughs> but they, because there were so many schools that they were identifying, uh, and because the policy you guys adopted based on the state uh, one did require a complaint to come in front of the board to make the complaint formally, you guys don't actually have to do anything because you don't have a formal complaint because they didn't come. Right? So you are under no obligation to take any action at this time. However, what I would urge you guys to consider is the idea that these guys have done an excellent job of, of really articulating the origins of it and that it's not a Confederate-based rebel like they claimed in that letter. So I think we've debunked that successfully with the work of these kids. Um, the second communication that the NAACP put out was not to us specifically, um, I don't think, maybe it did come to Bill, but it was sent to the media and it talked about the idea that they felt that the policy, that the law which required the policy um, fell short. And their argument was that it fell short because it required um, people who were the historically marginalized people to be the one to complain. And it didn't have the majority hold themselves accountable for what their logo or branding might do. And so that was their complaint. So that's why they said we weren't going to come. They felt that the, that the legislature should have had that phrase differently and that it should, the owner should be on you, not on responding to a complaint. So with that distinction in mind, and again, you're under no obligation, um, I would respectfully suggest that the board not dismiss it right now, but rather continue to consider it. And by continuing to consider it, what I would suggest, just the way that these guys did it, and just what, what Turner pointed out now about students being involved, is to put it back on a second student group to continue the exploration around that second point about whether the rebels as a colonial figure does represent a group that oppressed others. Now, and I'm not, I don't want to go in there saying that I'm in favor of changing it. I love the rebels myself, all right? But I think it's something that we should at least talk through and allow another group to do that part of the policy and then come back and report back to you guys at some point. This is an excellent PBL project for uh, high school students in the fall. Um, it could be a civics class, it could be a PBL that we do or it runs on its own. Um, I get some kids who are interested in looking at that specifically. Um, so that would be my suggestion with respect, but obviously you're not even obligated to do anything at this point because you don't have a formal complaint for it. So I think that's a great I wanted to clarify that just so you guys knew sort of what you, yeah. where you were operating with it. Yeah, that's a great live civics lesson and uh, just you know, something even better about our school. Uh, I think, what does everybody else think? Continue to do it. <coughs> I'm always concerned with inaction of the board, and I, I think that we should take a position, and that doesn't prohibit this board or the school district from looking at it 
at any point in the future that we choose to. But given the correspondence that we've received, I think at this time, um, the correspondence we received was pointing at our mascot and the rebel as being a Civil War figure. I believe the research that was done very clearly um, disputes that. And I think this board should take action saying that we do not believe at this time our mascot violates um, our policy or, and if we choose to continue to look at that in the future, I think we can. Um, we have some students here. We can ask our student body here, you know, by show of hands, if they want us to change their mascot tonight and, and see what they say. I'm not, again, I'm not suggesting we change anything right now, so don't want to be clear about that. Well, I'm suggesting that we make a statement that we're not changing anything at this point because the terms of the complaint that we received have been thoroughly disproved by our eighth grade students. That's true. Good point. Is that a motion? That is a motion. I'll say it. <laughs> All right. Discussion. Okay. Uh, I, I'm done with my discussion. <laughs> uh, I just think it's a good idea to formally address the complaint because it's been very public. Um, I don't, like Drew said, I don't think it prohibits anybody from continuing the conversation, but I think that the original point that was brought up has very clearly been refuted and I think that it's worth us making a statement about it because it's been a publicly a public issue. Okay. Anybody else? I'm wondering how many of the kids want it to stay the same. Yes, both of us do a lot of president. The yeah. president looks fairly unanimous. Kids. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've had motion, discussion, any other? Sorry. Uh, I, I wonder if we can take time for the students asked us a different question, which I thought was a really powerful and important question, which was um, what do we do to make sure nobody's harmed by that? And I think that I without offering any criticism of your opinions or your research at this point, I'd love to see the students and see some discussion of that, because that's, that's not a question that um, we've addressed, but I think it's, it's an important one that you posed, and um, a really good one for thinking about how to move forward. Whether it's now or later, I don't know yeah, yeah, that, but I just, you, you opened a really important conversation, and, and if, I'd love to see us address that more as part of a, a ultimately a response. As in above and beyond? This or rather motion. than voting and closing now, I, 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 I feel like they opened a, a lovely door for thinking about how this answer will sit with our school community and our larger community, and I would feel comfortable answering that um, before as part of our response. You're only closing one aspect of it, right? You're leaving the door open for the conversation. Oh, yeah, I don't think that the conversation needs to cease. Uh, no, no, my intention would not be to, to <coughs> stop the students from engaging in research and conversation. It's just to address the very specific complaint that we received, right? Um, which was on the board. I wanted to um, tag on and say that uh, bringing it back to the student body I think can be very powerful and we have our PBL Wednesdays which give a lot of power to um, for students to think creatively and I think it would be a pretty fascinating PBL project to study rebranding the rebel the Leland and Gray rebel should that continue to be the mascot but perhaps it presents itself looking a little differently um, to clarify some of the blurred lines. Um, so what, wherever we end up with the branding, um, I think the PBL would be an excellent opportunity to rebuild the image and get uh, the students really into it. Um, it sounds like its origin story came from the students and I think it's powerful and gives that um, power back to the students at such a, we're in a very different era now, so. Good. I also think maybe a town hall could be great. Just get 
a lot of student views all at the same time. And I think that would be a great thing to bring all the students together because that really gets views from all that. And I'd love to get middle school involved through that time as well. Great. Go ahead, Can I make a suggestion that maybe you vote on Drew's motion, but maybe with a, a caveat or a continuation that the work continues and you're specifying that you're, you're you want to encourage the student body to continue an exploration while at this moment, based on the complaint, simultaneously accepting the research that these students have done and continuing to use their mascot in the interim. At least that gives you the ability to kind of push it out there to give that work to do, but still acknowledges that you're making a decision based on the complaint that was made, as Drew pointed out. Right, right, I agree. And I think, tell me if this is your intent, right? It's just the broader, yes, continue with the rebel, right? However you want to uh, frame it as a, in 2023, yes, different generation, that's, that's probably a path that you can, you can go down. Was that kind of your intent, just a, more broadly? And, and also to say that we've answered, they, the eighth graders have answered the question. Yeah, it really is a, a conversation for the students. Mm -hmm. So we have been challenged by people um, that are not part of our current community that sent a letter that was full of false uh, information about the origins of our uh, mascot, which we have done, we being, our students have done research, and I think we need to clarify that for the public, that you know our mascot is not um, a Confederate soldier, and if the student body um, would like to continue having that conversation, I would absolutely encourage them to. Um, we should, and that's why I asked the town hall question earlier, um, encourage the student body to participate in these discussions and bring their feelings back to the board. So whether this complaint was brought or not, if the student body as a whole came back to this board and asked us to rebrand the school, that would be something I think this board would take very seriously. So. I would say that this would be the end of this action, and if the student body would like to continue this conversation, we should absolutely uh, encourage them to do that. Yeah. Okay. Agreed. I would also, just as a side note to that, I, I don't know that we as a board can order the students to do another presentation. Like, that's not like a thing that we can really do anyway, so I think it's fine to encourage <laughs> direct the student more discussion. Board member. The student board member can be directed Wait, to it. Just the one. We can just only the, order the no, one. No, you have two. <laughs> it sounds like they want to anyway, but yes. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, I, well, I would there. certainly encourage all of the conversations that everybody would like to have. Yes, go ahead. I think one thing that wasn't considered by them was when the NAACP, what it seemed like was when they were trying to make a list of all the offensive names in school mascots, they just went down the line and they saw ours and they assumed it was the Confederate Rebel. Because if they looked at our mascot, you would see that it's nothing like the Confederate Rebel. And I think if they actually took some time into research about our school, then they would have had a different complaint. And it would have been a very different discussion. Well, I'm glad you did the research. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other discussion? And who do we have in Zoom? Sarah. Sarah. Is it just Sarah? Just, 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 just Crystal Long. I don't know. Crystal's here. Just for clarity, can yeah. we actually get the motion stated? Yeah. Like, Drew was going on. Is, is that a motion? Yep. <laughs> that is the motion. But, yeah. In however many sentences. All right, so I will move that uh, in response to the complaint that we received, that we have done the research, uh, or our student body has provided us the research to dispute the findings or the complaint, and that we will continue moving forward with the Lillian Grave Rebel uh, at this time. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right, everybody clear, and let's see, so we only have Sarah out there. Um, all right, we'll do a roll call. So, Sarah, I'll start with you. How do you vote? Aye. 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 
Uh, but I, I'm going to add that I really hope that we continue this conversation. I'm not going to hide the conversation. I. I. All right. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Round of applause. All right, next to the recommendation from the TES principals, C35 age of admission. Hi, thank you. Um, okay, so I, getting out my script here, I took a request from a parent on March 8th um, for a pre-K student to be allowed into kindergarten um, even though they do not meet the five-year-old birthday for our district um, they are well within the state's cutoff so I took the request from the parent and I filed the Vermont policy for age of admission um, I reviewed the student's birthday which is in October and the state's cutoff is December 31st according to the policy so I observed the student in different settings and determined that they are high functioning and display kindergarten readiness in the social setting. Um, I communicated with her pre-K teacher and we're in agreement that socially and academically she was well within the expectations of a kindergarten student at the time. Um, I tasked our academic support teacher with administering some kindergarten beginning of year assessments and that student was well above the 50th percentile for um, some math concepts and letter naming and letter sounds, which is what we would give to regular kindergartens coming in in September anyways. Um, the class size is expected to be around 16 students next year, so we're well within our range for keeping one classroom, um, even with this additional student. And I believe this is the best interest of the student to progress to kindergarten so that we can continue to foster her intellectual and social development. And I thank the board for considering this request. Renee, can you just mention uh, the age again? Uh, for the student? Yep, of this particular, yeah. So yeah. this student is, will be turning five in October. I believe our, district's policy is to turn is turning five in September, September 1st, I believe it is. Um, but the state policy actually goes until December 31st to turn five to enter kindergarten. That requires a motion from the board. What's that? I didn't hear that. Oh, does this require a motion to the board? Is that why it's on here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah. seems like- I believe so. Yeah, just to hop in, uh, the board has to approve the recommendation of the administrator as policy C-35 states. Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so, Renee, we're talking how, six weeks difference? Yes. October or something? Yep. Okay. yep. Can we just make the motion to approve this? Early admission for this student? Yes, we can. Okay, I will do that. I'll second that. And Leanne, second? Okay. Any discussion? Sounds great. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any other discussion? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote and I'll start with you, Sarah. Hi. Crystal. Hi. Drew. Hi. 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 Aye. 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 All right, motion carries unanimously. Thanks, Renee. Appreciate it. All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Hey, we might as well stick with you. Let's start with the uh, principal's reports. <laughs> I'm muted. Sorry. You read my mind, though, Al. <laughs> um, so we've got some exciting stuff wrapping up the school year. It's hard to believe that there's only like 20 something student days left. Um, 
So we have started our state testing, which is um, somewhat new. It's a little familiar where it kind of looks like a guest back, but we've been finally good with the technology and the training. And so that is underway and going fairly well. Um, we generally have our spring data meetings at the end where teachers connect with the next grade level and they talk about the students that they'll be getting into their classrooms, um, talking about their strengths and challenges academically and socially and emotionally. Um, one other exciting thing for actually next year coming up, I had some teachers approach me about piloting um, the math program that a lot of our schools in West River as well as River Valley have been trying out called Bridges Mathematics. Um, so that was really great to see teachers coming to me asking for it. So the pilot will send you everything for free for a one year pilot program and then collaboratively we'll make a decision together comparing it to the program we use now and decide which one is best for our students and perhaps um, well if we make that decision to go with bridges we'll be asking for, to put it into the budget and um, so yeah so exciting some some exciting consistent maybe continuity between the schools for curriculum is exciting to me and the fact that my teachers were asking for it is pretty cool so um our farm to school is keeping on going we've got our uh, garden beds that are assembled and being filled within the next week um and we're coming up with a plan for keeping those maintained throughout the summer um students just did a planting and seed workshop outside on our picnic tables over by the garden beds um, with Amy Duffy and she had someone come in and do the workshop. Um, I believe his name was Cedar, his first name. So the kids had a lot of fun with that. And just last week we were able to use our greens from our hydroponic grower that we got in our actual salad bar at school. So that was really cool to have some of our own food in our cafeteria. And the kids said it tasted better. <laughs> so that's a plus. Um, we have our whole school field trip coming up for Montshire, so we're organizing that and figuring out all the logistics and details. And we are pretty fully staffed. We have just a couple openings for academic support teachers, one full-time and one half-time. Um, and so we're looking to fill those. We've had a couple interviews and we'll continue to seek out the right candidate. So. Any questions or? No, thanks, Renee. Okay. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. And Monica. Hi, good evening, everybody. So let me tell you what's happening at Jamaica Village School. Uh, our Ames Web assessment is almost complete. We still have a few stragglers that we need to catch. Um, we did complete our, I don't even know how we say it, Vermont CAP, BT CAP, the, the state assessment. We completed the science portion of that with our fifth graders as a, a test run. And we're going to start with uh, the third through fifth graders tomorrow, actually, with the language arts portion of it. And then next week, we will finish up with the math testing portion of it. Our fifth graders returned back from Key Waden on Friday. They had a wonderful time. Everybody all rested this morning when they returned to school. So I'm guessing that they had some time over the weekend to get themselves back together. Um, our outdoor wilderness program is in full swing. We're so excited to continue our work with Jamie. And the uh, last time we were together, we worked on our shelter, we built our fire, and we foraged around the school campus for edibles. And we fill, we actually were able to feed about, let's see, 24 people with what we collected around uh, the campus. So that was just really, really cool to do. I was impressed with that whole lesson. And I, that I'm wondering if the adults had more fun than the kids because uh, uh, it was just really amazing to see what we could just pick up off the ground and be able to put together to eat. I never knew that. 
So, um, what else is going on? Uh, we had uh, the West River Valley Thrives Parent Connection uh, group came to our school. Uh, we also had our teddy bear tea. And our really big event recently was the Boy Scout Pinewood Derby was held at Jamaica Village School. And so that was a huge success. And um, we are also planning our end of school year field trip. We're going to the New England Aquarium. We have a lot of uh, students that are very interested in marine life. And some of them have never actually been to a, an aquarium before. So we're very excited to get on a big bus and go there for a full day. So let's see, what else is happening? Um, of course, we're still working on our graduation uh, logistics for our fifth graders, and we are going to be working in the pollinator garden right there on Water Street in Jamaica Village. And uh, we also participated in the Green Up Day on Friday. So we walked all around the village and we were able to collect two uh, bagfuls of trash. So that's what's happening at Jamaica Village School. Thank you very much. Thanks, Monica. Wow, everybody's got a lot going on. Spring cleanup, aquariums. Awesome. Scotty, how about you? Um, I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, we have been doing the cognitive testing, the new testing at school. Um, our fifth graders, the week before, um, the week before they went to Key Wade and they completed the science test, kind of similar to my colleagues, just trying to um, trying to make sure that it worked. Like we really had never tried it before, and it worked like a charm, um, which was great. Um, Key Wade was really an incredible experience this year. You know, it's it's the first time that these kids from all the different schools got together. This is the class of 2030, um, and they were all in the rain together at Key Wade for a week, and it was amazing. I've got to tell you, your kids are amazing. I never, I was there for three days, I never heard one complaint about the rain. Everyone was prepared for it, and as if, well, they've grown up in it, they know what they're doing. Um, it was great, um, and I, of course, had a blast. Um, I, again, want to, uh, want to say that um, we have identified an excellent teacher to recommend tonight to the board for our second grade position. I was really excited about that. You know, our pool is, uh, you know, right now the pool for most education jobs is pretty small, and I've got to say that I really feel like we lucked out and we found a really, really qualified person. So I'm excited about that. Um, let me see. The end of the school year is coming, so we have a lot of things planned. And um, So we've got a teddy bear tea coming. If you don't know what that is, that it's, uh, God, who runs those? The agency. Um, there is a tea in every elementary school that invites parents to come in, get some acclimated to the school, they meet the teacher and the principal, and, um, and I really love it. Um, we've got the all school morning recess coming. We normally only do uh, uh, K to two and three to five recesses at lunchtime, and this is more of a, a thing where uh, people, would, parents would be able to hang around and the kids have earned this uh, through our reward system. Um, we've got an all-school sing on May 22nd, and our last all-school sing will be on June 12th. On June 12th, we're going to have a community picnic. Our excellent chef is going to um, be, uh, with a few uh, helpers, is going to be serving hot dogs and hamburgers, and it's going to be a parent event. It should be really fun. Um, our farm and field day is May 26th, and that is an effort through our farm to school program. We've got lots of guests coming, and the kids will go in um, non-grade level groups. Um, and they will rotate through, I think, seven different uh, stations. Um, in the, Is that when you wear the overalls? Yeah, well, I, I always wear the overalls. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, move up day will be uh, uh, May 30, and I know that Leland and Gray spent a lot of time to make sure that uh, they coordinate with our, our um, sending counselors from each school to make this a su success. It's always great at Leland and Gray when the kids go up. You know, they're so excited after Q Wade. You know, they're just so excited to kind of get on with things and uh, the fifth graders. So I'm really stoked about that. And I really appreciate uh, the work at Leland and Gray and, and the coordination. Um, we've got a, a second field day coming up, and that's more of like a um, Taggart, our, our PE teacher's running it. The kids love it. It's all games. It's all water. It's all just springtime fun. And that'll be on June 6th. Um, the last student day and last staff day are now very separate because of the um, uh, three days that we're uh, – Wave. So um, we are really, I feel very lucky, we're planning all of this um, time. We have three full school days 
our three full work days that we can uh, plan for next year. We can transition kids and transition classes really effectively. We're going to be looking at uh, some of our teaching models um, that are in play in the school. We're going to be looking at, um, again, Bridges Math is a very complex thing, and this was our first year of implementation. Um, by the way, I want to say Renee mentioned that we had piloted Bridges and that they were now piloting it. It works the other way, too. And next year, we're going to be using a, a tool called Wit and Wisdom, a curriculum for grades four and five. And they, they, uh, the teachers at uh, Townsend had already piloted that and really like it, and the kids like it. So we're going to be trying that, too. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Yeah, so just want to start off, just so the board, the board does not know this, this is Teacher Appreciation Week. Ah, all right. And as Scotty mentioned, the um, candidate pools, uh, we've heard from the colleges over the years that fewer and fewer people are going into education. Um, and so I just want to bring it to your guys' attention that this is a profession that's thinning and thinning out, and we need to be especially appreciative of the ones that we have as we go through this. So Let's appreciate um, our teachers. Yeah, as I told the students this morning in our assembly, they, you know, in the last several years have been among the hardest in, in my, you know, last 30 years in education, um, based on COVID and coming out of it and relearning how to teach in lots of ways and all the challenges that have happened in behavioral and mental health stuff. And it's just been, it's, it's they need to be recognized. So um, I do have, as Scott mentioned, some names and some positions that, that uh, Dana has actually filled. Dana's, Dana's here in the house. He's sitting back there. He's like dressed like a kid, so you know, he doesn't recognize him. But, <laughs> um, but he's been filling these positions for next year um, as well. There's still a few that are that are vacant, um, and I think I'm going to talk about one of those. Right, you, Al, you want me to say a little bit about the campus supervisor position? Yeah. Um, so one of the things that we had uh, Esther money put aside for um, this past year and for next year uh, was doing some PBL coordination, and our PBL coordinator left. Uh, the end of last summer and we had to pivot and so we were able to um, have some other folks take on those responsibilities with extra stipends instead of having a whole person just come in new to that and so we had some savings from that so that plus some other extra money that uh, Lori has been able to cobble together for us that's sort of the last of it uh, we are able to uh, put together this um, uh, campus supervisor position for next year and it'll just be for one year and then we'll talk about it and see what you guys think moving on from there. The idea of the position is that the person will provide support for the administration around all matters of safety in the building, um, with helping out with crisis uh, situations, being the, on the crisis team, um, and also um, they will be the lead person to be out and about helping monitor bathrooms, uh, hallways, keeping kids where they, where they need to be, so the student management side of things. Um, as you know, we'll have two new administrators or one, one in a new role and one brand new administrator in the building next year. So uh, having this additional support and no cost to taxpayers for this coming year seems like a pretty good use of resources. So um, just wanted to mention that. The is currently posted, so people, if anybody's interested. I saw Charlie March have left. Maybe I can get him to come back. We'll find someone <laughs> to, to do that. Um, and then just one other new thing I wanted to mention. You can obviously read some other stuff on here as well. But as we start to think about Leland and Gray as um, as sort of the project based and the experiential learning school, thinking about how do we expand offerings. So you've heard a little bit about the Journey Away program and what they've done in shifting the focus from Journey East exclusively to a more broader sense of, of uh, experiential learning. Uh, one new opportunity that we've had brought to us uh, recently um, is this concept called Project Bike Tech. And Project Bike Tech is a program that puts fully operational bike repair shops in schools. And the idea is that you set up a teacher to run this as a curriculum that they, this is a nonprofit that provides. They provide a fleet of bikes, helmets, all these really professional tools, benches, stands, the whole nine yards, so you can educate 20 kids and have a teacher bench all as part of this program. Um, we are, we, we put a deposit down in the program using some funds this year from contracted services and um, we, after exploring some more of the money that you guys have set aside for BEMSA, we recognize that that is probably only going to cost about half of what we anticipated um, after we've explored more of that program. So we have some money there to help go towards this. And uh, Jessa Harger, who's our Journey Away person, has also um, done a series of uh, grant requests as well to try to get some money. 
So the hope is that that will have a minimal impact on local budget, but that next year, which is the startup year, is the most expensive that we should be able to get that off the ground and kids in that by this fall. We're gonna utilize the basement shop down here in the back so the kids can roll the bikes right out the door and, and test them out and repair them. And we'll also repair the fleet of bikes that were purchased with REAP funds, uh, which is other grants uh, for the phys ed department a couple of years ago. So we have now, right now we haven't been able to repair some of those bikes. Now we'll have kids do those repairs and get experience. Partnerships will also be with Stratton um, and uh, there'll be an industry credential as well for bike repair. We will be the only public school in Vermont to have a program like this. The only other school, high school in Vermont that has this is Linden Institute, which is one of the four historic academies, which obviously has got a few more bucks laying around than we do. So it's a pretty cool opportunity for our kids to have access to this. The next phase for this organization is to shift into what they're calling uh, Project Snow Tech, uh, which would be a full ski and snowboard tuning and repair and all that kind of stuff as well, which would, they would utilize the same shop. So that's, we could be the first to pilot that in, uh, in the country. So that's the next thing that they're gonna have on. So we're pretty excited about this opportunity um, and using a lot of grant money to, to fund it, um, as well as just a, a small deposit this year to kind of center space. So we'll be able to do 20 kids at a time in a bike repair shop. And possibly do middle school exploratory with it as well. So all ages. Pretty excited. Sure. Will it interfere with Drama's ability to? Nope. Use Sam and I have talked, and we have a long time. So he's good. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So do, I mean, we think about this is with the journey away stuff, going to different places and having different <coughs> focus uh, points, um, the work-based learning, um, the VEMS opportunities for some kids we're going to be doing next year um, down there, um, and our Wednesday PBLs, which are now part of our, our normal process of days. Um, and there's a new garden school thing that's coming out of the, the um, Journey Away thing as well. So, I mean, there's some really cool hands-on experiential learning opportunities that are gonna be happening here. And our kids are gonna have access to things that kids, that kids in large schools don't have access to. And that's incredible. So, you guys laid the challenge out of thinking about you know, programming and making sure that we have that we're doing things really, really well if we're going to be paying money. And so these are things that we can do really, really well. So I'm excited. Well, you'll hear more about it as it rolls out. And um, yeah, you'll let the, we'll let the kids talk about it once they get into it. So it's great. Cool. Uh, yeah. Any, I'm happy to take any other questions. I think I covered the key points I want to. Any questions? All right. Thanks, Bob. Yep. Thanks, everybody. And Bill. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. Um, echo you all. Great presentation by the students. Um, I provided the written report, just a couple of highlights. We reorganized the WCSU on May 31st of this month. And also connecting to uh, item F in your agenda. Uh, the executive committee met this morning uh, to hear about uh, the possibility for us to participate in a contingency-based um, action to recover any costs or any remediation for the PCB work. Um, as of right now, West River has not in, uh, incurred any costs, um, but uh, as we get all of our buildings uh, tested over the course of the next 18 months, as the legislature is fluid in their different approaches to the PCBs, um, it's very similar to what we did with the Jewel um, contingency-based uh, action five years ago, which is going to bring between thirty and sixty thousand dollars in the fall for work with our students. Uh, so the executive committee met this morning and approved uh, us moving forward with that. And so I'm bringing it forward to each individual board, um, just looking for the board to support that we will join. Um, a contingency um, action, if necessary, to recover whatever we have to pay. Currently, right now, it's 20% that the district has to pay. 80% is offered by the state, but they've only allocated $32 million, which uh, should all be gone just to pay for the Burlington um, destruction and transport of their situation. So I am asking for a motion from the board to support uh, the West River 
district uh, to participate in a contingency based uh, action to collect uh, costs associated with PCB remediation. So moved. Second. Sounds like uh, only upside on that one. Right? There's no. <laughs> No, we don't have to pay anything up front. It is only upside if it's necessary. What buildings have we had tested at this point, and what are our results showing? Uh, I think Greg's in the audience, so I would defer to his uh, expertise. Leland and Greg was tested over April break. Um, 12 to 16 weeks is what we were told, but um, Twin Valley, when they had their issue, they had it in like four or five, so I'm hoping that we'll be a little more timely. We did get the results back. Um, that Jamaica was got a clear bill of health. So. Have we done the other two buildings yet? The other two, no, they, they, they sent us a whole schedule like two years ago and I, I'm, I'd have to look back on it. I don't really worry about Townsend. They say it's 1920 to 1980. Townsend is 1850 and 1988. So they're kind of actually around it. Um, the rest of our schools are all kind of right in the middle of it, right, you know, 50s and 60s and so, but you know, J Jamaica didn't have any, there was a very, uh, the very small section of Marlboro, um, which is in our district, did come back with positive results. So we're 50-50 at this point. So, yeah. So as I know, you'll come. Thanks, Greg. <clears throat> All right. Any other discussion? Seeing none, Sarah, how do you vote? Hi. Aye. 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 And motion carries unanimously. And then item E is just uh, all of our uh, employees will be bringing back their contracts by May 15th and this board won't meet until June. Uh, so if you'd like to give permission to the board chair to sign those contracts, you can. You can also wait until June. I just wanted to put it on the agenda in case you wanted to provide that. That allows the chair to sign it and be able to return that to each teacher instead of waiting the three weeks. I would move to give the board chair permission to sign contracts. All second. Any discussion? <laughs> Sarah, how do you vote? Aye. 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 And the motion carries in so. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bill. All right, moving on to old business. Entertain the motion to approve the minutes of April 12th, 2023. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Seeing none. So I'm going to do this a little differently. We're just going to say it. All those in favor say aye. And you can chime in, Sarah, if you want. All those in favor say aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Seeing none, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And approve the financials. I got them. I got them too. Let's go. Okay. All right. It's two, right? Yes. Okay, I'll make a motion to approve the pay orders. I'm trying to figure out. Five one. What do you got? Five one and five three. Where do you get the number on this thing? <laughs> it was on the email. Oh, okay. Five one and five three. In the amounts of one million eight thousand one hundred and eighty eight dollars and forty one cents and one hundred and eighty three thousand four hundred and seventy one dollars and forty five cents. I said. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Seeing none. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. All right. West River Renewable asking for a subcommittee. So at the last board meeting, um, we received a correspondence request uh, from West River 100% Renewable to create a subcommittee. 
and the board thought it might be a good idea to ask, ask our partners in West River Transportation if they could attend the meeting so that we could hear their voice as the board considered this request. And I think we have Lindsay on the Zoom. Oh, <laughs> okay. I don't know. Todd was supposed to join us um, in the, the gym. I don't know if he did it or not. Okay. <laughs> so if Todd wants to speak, I will chime in if need to. What is it that you're looking for? Uh, we were, we're not looking for anything. We were asked uh, if we would like to form a subcommittee. Um, yeah, right. So we have actually. We have a transportation committee in Wordsboro and Dover. That's worked out really well. Most of the time, Greg's there for that. That has worked out well. I think it was Greg who said we might want to do it regional-wise, I guess. Um, I don't have any problem, you know, forming a group if that's what you want to do. Um, what types of things are they looking for? I believe the main impetus is uh, electric. Although we have Paul here, if, if Paul wanted to speak yeah, to what he's interested in. Speak to that, Tom. Thanks. Good question. So, uh, Greg and I have chatted as well as Bill. And so, if you don't know me, Paul Pegas and uh, part of the West River 100% uh, Sustainable Group, which is a nonprofit group. And we have had an opportunity where we tried to apply for a grant uh, that might have provided. Uh, seed money and an initial bus and charging station, but uh, it didn't work out for various reasons. But the reason for the transportation committee, as Bill mentioned, was to try to coordinate all the players that would be involved in looking at moving forward to an electric bus or electric buses for this for the district. And uh, rather than the West River, the group that I'm in trying to give advice to the board and then trying to contact Todd and then Greg, you know, if we could loop all these people together and, and meet on a regular basis, we can discuss ways to move forward to explore, because this is not saying that we have to do this, but explore an, an option that would be environmentally friendly, it would be cost efficient uh, for the district in the future. We all know climate change is here and we're trying to respond to it, as well as uh, other factors such as increasing cost of diesel fuel and so forth. So uh, the idea of the Transportation Committee, again, is to try to include all the people who are involved. Uh, West River Transportation obviously is providing a service now, and uh, we would like to get their input on um, historical running of bus transit for this for the area, and then moving forward, do they want to participate in a, you know, a really new endeavor uh, that seeks to address those issues that I mentioned before. Um, besides the people that are here, we thought that representatives from the other board, of River Valley, uh, would also be helpful. If we're exploring buses for the district, uh, there's an economy of scale that, that makes that shift is much better. So, happy to answer any questions or anything that the board or West River Transportation has. Anything from folks here? I mean, there's a lot that could be said, but I guess they won't do it here. If we're going to form a committee, we can do it through the committee. Um, West River is operated on private property, which is a fire and truck line. And the owners are right here. They've made it very clear they do not want electric buses on their property because even though he says they're environmentally safe, they're not. Um, the batteries are a huge issue. Um, so, I mean, I could give go on about this tonight, or we can wait to get the committee and then do what you want to do. But there's a lot more that needs to be said before anything ever happens. Sure. A couple of things that uh, were kind of brought to my attention that really make sense. We had a conversation previously about electric buses 
and at the time we didn't include our bus company um, in those conversations, which would be the reasons that um, we really couldn't move forward. And then we're now bringing this topic back up, and in between those two meetings, uh, we bought vehicles for the district um, to operate, such as a pickup truck for our maintenance department, uh, you know, driver's ed cars, and um, we didn't even consider using electric vehicles. So at this point, you know, I just want to put out there that we were very quick to want to, you know, push our bus company into um, electric buses, but yet we weren't really willing to take the leap when it was kind of our money and our responsibility um, and our job to put in charging stations. So if if we're serious and we want to you know, go down this road of electric uh, infrastructure, then I would say it would be reasonable to expect that the district would make that step first before trying to force that onto you. Um, our contract. There's not even a charging station on any one of your schools. We don't even have charging electric vehicle charging stations at any of our buildings. Currently. So it's kind of like you're not promoting this at all. Um, you've got four Subarus down to the Newbrook Elementary School that they're all gas. Like Drew said, the pickup, brand new pickups, diesel. The driver's ed car is gas. So that would be where I would start, I think. Um, Again, yeah, I could go on for quite a while about how unsafe these buses are, but I think Drew's right. I think you guys need to figure out whether you really want to go down this route or whether you want to start out with your own vehicles and work your way from there and put some charging stations in. The, the rapid charging station for one of the buses, just the charging station alone, is $40,000. So you can charge a battery on the bus. Um, to get the, pro get the power from Route 30 down to Brookline is another 40,000. Then they figure 20,000 digging underground from wherever the pole is over to where they put the charging station. So you're, you're talking 60, 60 plus thousand dollars before you even think about getting a bus. These buses are 300 and some odd thousand dollars a piece where the diesels are 100,000 a piece. You can buy three new buses compared to one electric if you take one of these electric buses, which is what they're having problems with, on a field trip somewhere, they don't make it. They're not, they're supposed to go 125 miles. They're not doing it. The buses are sitting, waiting for somebody to come with a generator to recharge the batteries, and it takes eight hours to do that. So you got a whole group of kids that were gonna go to a game somewhere that are sitting on a bus that won't go anywhere. Um, I talked to the mover today. They had trouble with them. They, they got them all shipped up to Burlington because Burlington's much more level. It, probably, it makes sense or something like that. Like Brown and Road it probably makes sense, but up here, we don't go anywhere where there aren't big, big hills. Um, I've done a lot of talking. Glenn's here somewhere. You here, Glenn? Glenn could tell you a whole lot more. The other thing too that Todd forgot to mention was that if our property owners or our, our landlords don't want us having the buses there. It means we have to find another building or build something to keep West River Transportation going. Um, and that's going to cost money as well on top of all this power. And will our power grid hold it? Well, and, and if I can, um, we're not uh, wanting to lose West River Transportation, but the cost to us said is we have to we would have to pay to have the, the power brought from Route 30 down to Hill Road and then it's well that was forty fifty thousand yeah and then to run it from Hill Road into the garage part is a they'd have to go underground and that's another twenty thousand. And that's just one let me jump over to Greg sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I just I just want to clarify we're kind of jumping into the deep water here unnecessarily. Yeah. <laughs> so when I met with Paul, my, my recommendation to him was that yes, there's a transportation committee that operates right now for River Valley. It functions very well as we review bus routes, we review you know requests from parents, right? You know all these different things. And so I said it would be great to create something with that district wide. The point of district wide being then you could absolve the River Valley's one and make it all one big one, and then. 
what, what Paul could then request is, hey, we would just like a seat at the table so that as other schools even are starting to buy buses, we have a seat at the table to look at this and to be continually looking at it and being heard. And so I don't think that the request of this committee is, is, is even to just look at electric. It is to form a committee to, to shape transportation for our district moving forward. Is, was, was kind of my idea, my vision behind it, of having other people be able to review bus routes and look at them and say, do these make sense before we post them, right? Or parents request a stop somewhere different. We get to look at it and say, does that stop work for us, doesn't it? So yeah, there may be some meetings where Paul doesn't really have a whole lot to say. I mean, we're in year one of a five-year contract with Todd. We have no grounds to make him do anything. Um, so, you know, but, but what this was was an opportunity for West River 100% renewable to at least have a seat at the table to be heard and, and to help shape these decisions as other schools do begin the bus process of using these and, and are they having successes or are they not, right? But at least we have a, a group of people to have those conversations and look at it moving forward. Um, because, you know, again, like not to get into the deep waters, but there's a, a bunch of money in that that is part of infrastructure, which part of that would be to help get electric there. But there's just so much that has to happen long before that. So I'm not trying to, you know, demean anyone's concerns, but I think that there would be, um, we're, we're just, we're talking about something that I wouldn't view as being anything we would be addressing at, as West River um, for a handful of years anyways, you know, so. I think tonight, what I would be looking for, and I, I feel like Paul's looking yeah. for, is just our commitment to creating that committee and the request of Todd to Todd, will you be part of it? And I think Todd is willing to be part of it because Todd has all the roots. And so. And the experience, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that you know, no matter what route we go, we need. Right. And, and I think the question Todd, would be also is, is it West River or is it WCSU? Right, right. So, so see, I thought it should be WCSU because then that way you get to, you know, uh, I'm not trying to avoid work, but I don't need any more <laughs> So it would be great to have one transportation committee rather, you know, I, I, I hear a free transportation committee. because the other thing that gets overlooked is Marlboro. They operate four buses. They, they're, um, they just recently released a bus, right? Um, Do uh, Dover did commit to, to buy a bus. They are going to... Um, go down the road, right? So again, so if we're all part of one committee, which we are part of one district, then we can start to look at it. How does this work out for them, right? How, how you know, does, does it work the way they want it to? Are they getting the, the, the torque and the strength and the, and the mileage out that they need out of them, right? I mean, um, Rich, Rich Werner is, is a fireman himself and he's dealt with some of the issues and knows full well some of the issues that some of these electric cars have had of, of burning for two and three days at a time with, and so, you know, those concerns are valid, and, and I think that we're going to be able to play that out over time. Um, but we don't have to today. So I'm just trying to save some conversation by saying that. Thanks, Greg. Leadership. Just a okay. quick question. Greg, could you foresee any efficiencies coming from this, um, from this uh, SUI committee? Like, I'm thinking, like, some, some within our district, we have some ownership of some vehicles. Do you think that there could be some sharing on some high high stress days for, for the company where we could, where like Dover might lend a bus for a certain thing? Or is that the kind of thing you'd be looking for? I, I think some of that could happen. I mean, I mean, even as it is, I know that um, one of the drivers from Marlboro helped out Todd a lot through, through basketball season for sure to come over and, and do some driving. And like I said, there is some, I mean, you know, there aren't that many CDL student, you know, drivers around. They, you know, they all know each other. They have a pretty good rapport. Um, but I think it would be great to, to be able to, you know, help each other out and review bus routes and look at things because, you know, in the, in the meetings I've been through so far, you know, people see things differently and they, they bring up other, you know, points that, that are easily missed. And so, you know, I think our bus routes could always use some, some honing and some tightening up um, and that can make it better and safer for, for families. And so I think that there is a lot of good that can come out of it. Thank you. Can I pipe in, Scotty, really quick? Sure. I wanted to answer your question. We had a driver that, like Greg said, come from Marlboro um, and help us out um, for the winter and spring season. But we also just um, let Marlboro borrow one of our smaller buses um, so that they had a bus because they had a bus going to Kewaden and they had a bus that was broken. 
um, and they reached out to us to borrow a bus. So they have borrowed a bus from us um, in the last week for a few days. So we have been working um, with Marlboro at least and helping them with their transportation needs. Thanks, Lindsay. Leanne? Uh, I was actually reviewing the copy of the contract that we have in our packet, and it looks like the contract's with WCSU, not with our district. So I think this really should be more of an SU uh, level committee for transportation. Absolutely. When's the next WCSU meeting? <laughs> the 31st of uh, May. I could put it on the agenda. Sounds good. Anybody disagree? No, I think that's. Okay. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, let's see. Moving on to long term planning update. Bob, do you want to? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank um, you. So, long term planning. How about that? Good times, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, the last, the last time we talked about this, we were. Um, Greg's leaving too. Hi, Greg. Um, <laughs> the last time we talked about this, we the administration had heard, had worked with um, several board members and um, Stevens Associates. We got a report, a draft report of um, their analysis of space, and um, they had a couple of um, models that they looked at. I guess you could say uh, schemes they called them. And so um, the, that group of, that subcommittee, I guess, of us uh, had the administrators in the group get together and um, kind of do a deep dive into the schemes to find out if they were really workable. And these are all, again, the one campus models. Um, based on the input from Stevens and from Greg, uh, one of the schemes we took off the table immediately, which, was, which included some additions to uh, Townsend Elementary School, uh, primarily because of the, um, which Greg is saying, I'm gonna screw up the wording on this, but having to do with water and septic systems that were not, would have been crazy expensive to do this work and it wouldn't have really gained us as much as you would have liked. So we took that off the table, which left um, a variation um, of some uh, additions slash additions onto Leland and Gray and um, in order to do pre-K, Ks in uh, at JBS and at Newbrook, or off-site, we didn't call it, we didn't say where, but we called it off-site. And um, one through four at Townsend, five through 12 at Leland and Gray. So we did a deep dive into that to see what would be the implications at Townsend and what would be the implications at Leland and Gray. There was a list of spaces that were lacking. Um, I mean, let me rephrase that. It was a list of needs that there was not space for in both buildings after we did that analysis. And so we concluded that you know, with some level of addition to Leland and Gray, you could potentially meet that need. And if you had some other kind of nearby space for Townsend, you might be able to meet that need. Um, the work that you guys contracted with Stevens did not include them going any further to estimate the cost of those additions. So we don't really know what that looks like, but we obviously know there's a cost and there's a cost to them looking at what the cost is. Um, and, um, and then in the meantime, Greg and I did a quick tour of one rental area here on, in the center of town to see if it would be uh, useful for that, um, for some of that extra space. Um, and I think Greg was supposed to do a more detailed analysis of that, but the Marlboro PCB stuff took him off track for a little bit. And so um, we haven't revisited that yet. But, we believe that there might potentially be the space there to meet the, the need of the overflow spots in Townsend, but that still leaves Leland and Gray needing some additional work to get it to a space where it could, could have um, utilized five through 12 there with all the necessary supports. Um, 
we didn't know, there were some questions that I'll give you one example of, without knowing what the pre-K and K offsite means, we don't know, for example, can we move IT out of Leo and Right now they take up two office spaces there, big rooms, I mean, spaces that could be used for something else. But if we don't know where they're going, it's, it's kind of hard to assume we can just kick them out and make it a classroom. So there's some things that we have to figure out what's happening, where, where these, the pre-KK offsite looks like. So I guess in the end, what it, seems, um, it seemed like maybe a good idea that at some point, and Drew has spoken quite eloquently about the idea that we've got to move something forward, right? And I think we all know that. So my proposal to you guys is that you charge us, the administration, with co-developing a, a, a presentation that uh, we would bring you by your August meeting. And um, that would account for all elements of the space, the needs, how they'd be used, financials, the whole nine yards. Um, I don't know if we'd be able to get costs on, well, I, actually, I, I know we won't be able to get costs on additions without you guys contracting for further work with Stevens, so I don't know if that's part of what you want to do or not. I don't know what that would be. Greg might know more about that. Um, but anyways, have us come back to you guys in August, the August meeting, with some sort of a presentation. We review it jointly. You guys make suggestions. We tweak it. And then, it's because it's really your presentation. We're just helping you prepare it. And then in September, end of August, September, we take it on the road. Uh, we visit the towns that are involved and we show it and we collect input. And then by the October meeting, you guys would have a bunch of data from families. You'd have more financial information. You'd have impact perhaps of what the construction would be and what bonds are running and all that. And so you could make decisions in October slash November as you roll into the budget season. So, I mean, it seemed like a timeline that might be workable. It involves getting something out there in front of the taxpayers and in front of the communities to show what this could look like. Um, and it would be just this one thing. Here's the thing. Here's what it looks like. Here's how much it costs. Here's the savings. Here's the additional expenses. Here's whatever. Here's the benefits educationally. Here's the limitations. Lay it all out and just give it to the taxpayers. The taxpayers in the community see what they say. So that, that's. I mean, that was sort of my proposal. I don't know if that's something that is amenable, if there's tweaks to that, or what you guys are thinking. I, the reason I'm saying August, I know it seems like far away right now, but I know sometimes you guys don't meet in the summer. I don't know how that's gonna look. I'm gonna be brand new in the super tenancy. I'm gonna be probably buried and trying to figure out what the heck that job means. Um, so I don't wanna overcommit and say I can get something to you guys sooner. Um, and I need my colleagues, the principals to help. I need Lori to help. I need Greg to help. I mean, there's a lot of work involved to do that. I'd be happy to have a couple of you guys on it, like we did collaboratively before, and have you guys help with that presentation as well to make sure that there's less tweaking that will need to done need to be done in August when we bring it back. But anyways, that's that's my pitch. Can I support uh, all that? So the main one of the things that I think Lindsay was there today, I believe. Right, one of the things that we really ran into was a lot of our schools aren't exactly flush with space as it is, and how they make it work is libraries one day a week. Well, four days a week, it's an AST space. It's a, you know what I mean? And so if all of a sudden everybody's in there and now libraries four days a week, you don't have all that. And so kind of what we're doing with the, with the potential of office space is to try to see and, and even like looking at what pre-K K offsite really looks like and then how much space and where IT can go is so that we can try to open up as many kind of flex spaces as we can in the schools that you could come up with that you could say hey you know here's space that can be scheduled out between special ed and AST to meet all of these other needs to to make the space you know and, and, and I think that the issue that really became glaring in when looking at it was all of our schools were developed before AST was a thing before special ed was a thing right so they have the, the straight classroom space but to then have all the additional office space um, and, and I even really pushed back a little bit with our special ed director and curriculum director of like, well, how are you doing it now? You know, you, you're, the office you have right now is only an 8 by 10. Why does it need to be bigger? And they were like, well, because we're actually not running groups in there. We're running them here. And, that, and you know, for me, that I had a real aha moment. Like, oh, okay. So, but then you'll lose that if that can. So just to give you an idea of kind of what we're up against. And so then it became clear that the only way we can 
really know what we can fit is you almost have to, you, you can't do a schedule, but you almost have to be able to schedule or create space in that way to, to give you something that you can really put forward and we can feel good about of like, yes, this can fit, yes, this can work, not like, yeah, we can try and make it work, right? You know, but, but to feel good about it, to feel like if we got bigger, we could absorb it, we can, you know, we, we also don't want to set something up that uses it, you know, everything to the square foot that we have. And if we ever started to grow again for, for whatever reason, whether it's more families moving to the area, um, that we can we can still have that ability as well. So, would it be helpful and to stay on the timeline if we gave a little latitude on um, the the Stevens piece? You know, talking about the additional spaces here. Uh, if we were to I mean, if you do the research and say, hey, this looks like a viable location, uh, and getting, getting their input on it. That do you mean for addition, possible addition space, you mean? Yeah, sorry, additional space, yeah. I mean, yeah, or, yeah or, I mean, it, you know, it's, it's going to be a matter of looking at the office space down the street, how much of that is truly viable. Um, <clears throat> Because there was some very awkward spaces, it used to be a dental office, so some of the spaces are kind of, they're still, you know, very interestingly shaped. So I, I want to get in there and kind of lay it out and say, okay, we know we can put 10 offices there. So what would those 10 people be that we could put there to then open up space that can become flex space, whether it be at Townsend or, or at Leland Gray, it might, it may even be a mix of both. And if all, all we have is pre-KK at, at, say, Newbrook, right? Well. What can we also do there to maybe open up space to create more, you know, potential flex office space? There is a really nice conference room um, in in that building uh, that, you know, you know, first thing I thought I was like, wow, that frees up a fourteen sum, which is the, the main conference room that I believe has its own calendar at Leland and Gray. It's, it's used so, you know, by so many people in so many ways that, you know. That would free that up. And that, that's a big space. It's a thousand square feet. So I mean, that could borderline be a classroom. It, like Bob said, IT is a pretty large space. So if we can open up three, four space, you know, three, four spaces there, two or three spaces over there, I think then it would we would really be at a place where we could look at um, that. What a what a potential you know. Then we could reach out to John Evans and say, hey, what would a what would a ten year lease look like? And then, okay, if we needed to do, say, a wing, then we go back to Steve and say, hey, we, we think we're pretty close, but we would need this. And then look at, you know, talk to them at least on, I, I mean, they told us it was around $500, $500 a square foot right now to, to build. And, and building up versus new actually drives out. So. so do you need anything from us? If, if Would you progress enough between now and our next meeting in June where you would need to contact Stevens, like we, so we don't hold you up. Any, any I, yeah, so I guess the question, so what yeah. you're asking for the sample is, are we gonna need to get Stevens to do more work? Is what right, you're right. Do, I mean, Greg knows that better than I do. Yeah, I, I, right, because you won't meet in July, you won't meet again until August. Well, no, 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 I'm saying between now and June, in our June meeting. That way, if they, we if we needed back to. We in June for sure, we should be able to tell you whether or not we're gonna need to engage them. And, and, and hopefully at that point, we could even be at a point where we could say to them, hey, this is what we would need from you. How much would it be to have you give us something formal that includes a, at least an estimate, you know, a budgetary quote. Okay. So that, you know, so that when we, I wanna really support you all in being able to put something forward that we can stand behind both financially and, and square footage and, and you know educationally that, that makes sense. Um, okay. So it sounds like a really tight timeline. I just didn't want us to hold you up if you want to set between them. Okay. Any other thoughts? So I have a question. Um, I know you guys have been doing the long term planning forever, but when we say a one campus model. Are we saying like all of our kids from Newfane, Jamaica, Townsend, all in one area, like all in Townsend? Is that what we're looking at when we say the one campus model? Bob, you want to lay out the 
Yeah, I mean, what, what, we were, what we were charged to do was to figure out, and what Stevens was charged with doing was to figure out if between Townsend Elementary School and Leland and Gray, could we fit the entire district. So then you had said um, keeping a pre-K and a K in Jamaica. Well, the, the, the model identified the pre-K and K as being off-site. Right. It didn't identify where the board would have to figure that out, but it wasn't part of the one campus because okay. because with it being part of the one campus, that model would have involved pretty significant renovation to Leland and Gray, and it was our feeling that it wasn't really a good fit because you'd be looking at third graders in Leland and Gray, and so the way that it's laid out and structured the building, it's not really the ideal model for that. So then, are we saying? We're going to keep our Townsend pre-Kers in the Townsend school so, and our Jamaica ones in the Jamaica so school. So the model does not have a pre-K in Townsend. The one campus model that they came up with does not have a pre-K in Townsend. Okay. I believe the assumption would be that you would, you would push those out, right? So that both Jamaica and Newbrook would run a pre-K and a K. And so then you would have, what was it, one through four at Townsend, five through 12 here. And the other piece just to throw out there too, is that you know, we, there's been a lot of conversation about like, what is long-term and how long-term is this plan? And thinking about this, I feel strongly that we have to think about this as the near-term plan and simultaneously, we still need to be talking about what's it looked like in 20 to 50 years. And that if it involves something different, then we ought to simultaneously begin exploring that as well. And in a situation where the numbers, even best case scenario, stay the same, having, having the one campus model with a pre-K and K through 12 in one building is possible with the right design, you know, and the right site and everything else. So just, but those two, like the idea of like, this is the for now, whatever it's five, 10 years, whatever the number is you guys decide on, that's what we're talking about. And simultaneously think about what, is, what does it look like after that, um, moving forward. So that we're setting up the next couple of generations for success in the Valley. So, but that's not what we were really just like, is there a way to do this? Is there, are there educational benefits and are there cost benefits to doing this? I think is really where it came out, right? And hopefully by then we'll know about this. Right, I can say this. So, so then we know really how so high things up in the area. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I mean, because 85% of Leland Gray was 69, which is right in the middle of it. So if, if that becomes an issue, that whole area, you know, becomes an issue. And, and it's a large portion of the building. Then you got to figure out what the cause of it is, that. what the remediation yeah. of it is. I mean, that's all. Having a test high is all in the beginning. Correct. Yeah, so once, if, if, just to give you a quick walkthrough, if, when, if, how about that? If you <laughs> test positive, the, the steps forward, you have two options. One, you don't use any of the space that is considered the area of concern, in which then you have a year to make a plan of how you're going to remediate and move forward. If you choose the other options and choose to use that space, you then purchase carbon filter um, air filters from a company in Canada. They ship them down, you put them in place, then you schedule retesting, which is where Marlboro currently is. Um, so then you have them retest and ensure that you have the PCB levels um, where they need to be. And then you have six weeks to be in in contract with an engineer to design to have the the continuation testing of figuring out exactly what gave you the possible result is it caulking in the windows which is what it's been in, in numerous schools um, is it masting is it carpet is it paint is it um, ceiling tile so they'll then go back through and they'll test that and figure out exactly what gave you the, po the positive test and then you have to immediately move forward with remediation so you know, there's, there's, there's just two paths forward. And so, you know, obviously at, at Leland and Gray, 85% of the building probably being the original construction, 
not using it won't be an option. So you would have to move forward with it. And, and not to pile on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's, also, there's also the sprinkler issue, yes, which yeah. we have to have by September a plan to the state on how we're going to deal with that, right? I don't want to bring that up. It's something we have to just be aware of. Yes, uh, so I reached out to the lawyer as directed by the board. Um, we emailed back and forth. He put me in touch with Kirk Moore, um, a uh, design architect out of Burlington who has done this before, has a, a lot of experience with, um, with code. He, um, I, I met with him um, just before April break. We toured the building, we walked through, we looked at it. Um, we, and he has all the documentation, every set of plans that I have for the building, all the information, the original permit from the 08 um, edition. I got that to him last week, and we are expecting to meet in, in the next week or so. He, he reached out to Patrick Banks, and we're all going to sit down for, for a meeting here soon to talk about what the path forward will look like. All right. yeah, Anything else? Oh, let's, uh, <laughs> there's more. <laughs> With the sprinklers, no, there's nothing. Okay, good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, any other thoughts? Got your nose on the lawn sprinkler, and you're all set. Okay. Office for that. Office for All right. Well. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, how, how are we doing on, uh, yeah, the ask accreditation? Uh, did you, is that, was that proposal, is that what you guys want to do? To go forward in, to go in, forward in August? August something in place? Yeah, okay. I, I, I guess I missed that, I'm sorry. Yes, we will do that. Can I ask you a quick question? Are you all also going to look at models where the elementary schools stay roughly configured as they are, or is that just after folks? Review this and then decide if they want to. We, are, we serve the pleasure of the board on this one, and it, the board had moved towards exploring the one campus model. So that's what will be, that's what the presentation will be, and then you guys can decide based on what you get for feedback and where you want to go after that. Thanks. Yep. So, Niask, is that what you said? Yes, sir. Uh, right, so uh, we filled out our application uh, in the winter. We had our initial uh, candidacy visit just like a week or two ago, um, where the representative from NIAS came with a, a member of the, from the field, and the two people uh, did a representative tour of Leland and Gray, and they did a tour of Townsend, just because they were only here for one day, and they had a very busy full schedule, so we did those two buildings. Um, it's not related to the one campus one way, sure, it was just, <laughs> just close by. Uh, they observed classes, they met with teachers, um, and they did, like I said, the building tour. They met with the central office, and they reported out to us. Um, our, basically, we're looking for um, to confirm our application was in fact close to what they saw, because we had a self-report on a bunch of the standards. Um, they felt pretty comfortable that that, that was the case. Um, they had some additional comments for us about how nice everybody was and how. You know, one of the guys got lost at Leland and Gray, and a sixth grader offered to bring him back up to the, the front office, and that was he was blown away by that. It was great. Um, so uh, yeah, so that went well. Uh, the administration is we are all going to be part of a training in May, the end of May, um, with NIASC about what the visits will look like, which will once we go through that process which we're doing prematurely because they are not approving our candidacy until their meeting at the end of June. But we're going into this because he assured us it's probably gonna be okay. So we will go through that training, they'll approve us at the end of June, and then they'll set up a schedule for us for what the next couple of semesters look like as far as the self-study, the visit, and then going into the tenure and deciding all visits, and so on and so forth. So yeah, we're, we're moving right ahead with that. see some bleary eyes. <laughs> All right, uh, I'll move it quickly to public comment. And if there is none, we will move on from there. 
Any public comment? Uh, yeah, it's been a long time since I've raised my hand. Uh, Ken McFadden here. I do have some public comment. Great presentation by the students earlier. Um, kind of feels funny doing this from this point of view. But anyway, uh, it's been a long time since I've done it this way. Uh, as far as the one campus model, my understanding was we were doing a feasibility study. And the feasibility study apparently came back that it, it, with what we have, it's not feasible. So we spent $26,000 or whatever it was to find out that the structure we have, it's not feasible. And it appears to me that the board and the administration seems to be having tunnel vision saying, this is what we're doing no matter what. It's, we got the experts in, they're saying with what we have, it's not feasible. Now everything we have, we're going to disrupt. We're going to move SU people because they, we're actually renting space to the SU people. And we're talking about reconfiguring that without discussing it with the WCSU board. Um, we're talking about renting more property. It just, all, all, everything that's going on here just seems to be, we have this idea, this is where we want to go and we're going to just keep throwing money at this one idea until we get it to work for us. I don't think the taxpayers are uh, going to be too happy with that. That's my personal opinion. And me being a taxpayer, I can honestly say I know one that isn't happy. Uh, and as far as using the two elementary schools as just pre-Ks, has anybody thought about doing a town vote on that? Since the fact of the matter is pre-K students are not required to be in any school building. Therefore, according to our charter, it would cut, we would have to have a vote from each town to take all elementary students out of our elementary schools. Preschool students are not elementary students. Thanks, Ken. Uh, okay. Go ahead. Well, no, just well, there would be K students in there, so there would be elementary students in there, and the the idea that you would it may feel like you're renting more space, but you you really wouldn't be because you give up the SU building because the SU offices would be able to move into say Newbrook if you were just running pre KK there or you know. Um, so there was just, it was just more like a, a matter of moving and, and the point of, of trying to get more space up here was to have more space in your one campus area for some of those for to, to open up you know like we said flex space um, but you would actually gain that back on the other end of, of not necessarily needing the current central office building because you could then lease that some of that space west river could lease some of that space back to the su from for central right. offices right. 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 Yep. Okay. all right any other comment okay seeing none i'll entertain the final motion motion to adjourn Ooh. second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. 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 I think you said hi, didn't you, Sarah? She logged out. Logged out. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought so. <laughs> that was a definite affirmative vote. We are adjourned. Thank you.